Good afternoon and welcome to the Particular Baptist Podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Vincent. You can find us and other podcasts at reformpodcast.com. Also check out our blog at theparticularbaptist.net. And I want to just give a quick shout out to our patrons who have been gracious to support our ministry, to Vince, who is our newest patron, David, the Aramus, and Stephen for your support. We thank you so much for that. Uh, and if you would like to support our ministry through that means, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the particular Baptist. Well, I have a special guest with me today. This is Brother David Timothy Gatewood coming all the way from Kansas City, Missouri. Brother Gatewood, thank you for joining me today. Hey, man. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate the invite. This is going to be fun. Yes, looking forward to it. Um, give us a brief background on yourself before we dive into our discussion today. Can I give the audience a little flavor of who we're talking to? Yeah. So as you said, my name is Timothy Gatewood. Um, I currently live in Kansas City, Missouri. I'm an adjunct professor for Spurgeon College and Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, I'm also the executive editor of Credo Magazine, which some of your listeners may be familiar with. Uh, and so that's done under the leadership of our editor in chief, Dr. Matthew Barrett. Uh, I serve. I also serve alongside Dr. Barrett when it comes to the uh, Center of Classical Theology, where I serve as the associate director. And to to keep the theme going of classical theology, uh, I'm also one of the book review editors for the Journal of Classical Theology. So you kind of see my interest, what I'm into there. Uh, <laughs> I can't I can't hide behind anything there. Uh, my family has lived in Kansas City since 2017, which uh, is when me and my wife, Beth, moved up here so I could participate in the doctoral program at Midwestern. Since moving up here in 2017, we've attended uh, Emmaus Church, which is a Southern Baptist and Acts 29 church in North Kansas City. We've been there the entire time we've, we've been up here. I underwent the pastoral training program uh, under the leadership of Emmaus. I was a deacon there for a while. Uh, yeah, and me and my wife, we have two sons, John Howard, who is four, and we just finished t-ball practice with him. He did great. Uh, not to brag, I think he may be one of the fastest kids on the team. So <laughs> we got a little Ricky Henderson on our hands. And then we have uh, Thomas, who's roughly one and a half, and uh, he's not that fast. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, anyways. Right. <laughs> yeah, he'll get there. All right. Well, thank you, brother, for that introduction. Now, kind of carrying along with the theme of, of the work that you do. So you work at the, you kind of manage the Center for Classical Theology and you help manage Credo Magazine. You know, what are some of the goals that you guys are doing there and what is some of the work that uh, is going on there? Sure. So we say Credo Magazine exists to retrieve classical Christianity for the sake of creating and cultivating renewal for the church today. So uh, theological retrieval, is at the heart of our goals. So if any of your listeners are, are unfamiliar with that phrase, theological retrieval, uh, I define it as rediscovering pre-modern sources in order to address contemporary problems without modern presuppositions. Hmm. Okay, so we see three different aspects of, of the form of theological retrieval that we're pursuing then. We have our pre-modern sources, our voices from the past, but we also have these contemporary problems, right, that, that must be answered or at the very least addressed. And then we have the issue of these modern presuppositions, which we must transcend or at the very least recognize, right, like just be aware of. So we have a di few different avenues uh, in which we pursue theological retrieval. So Dr. Barrett hosts the, the Credo podcast. He'll interview theologians and pastors, philosophers who are engaging with classical theism. Uh, we have our website, credomag.com. So we run a, a daily blog, which features shorter and a little bit more digestible examples of retrieval. And then specifically, my job in Credo, uh, I oversee the production of the, the magazine proper. So the magazine of Credo magazine. So three to four times a year, we will release an edition of a magazine, which will focus on like one topic and feature the work of about a dozen or so theologians or experts on that specific topic. Mm -hmm. And we'll share, you know, longer essays, interviews, book reviews, and more practically uh, oriented columns as well. And then we have the, the Center of Classical Theology, which is kind of our more uh, academic, systematic wing of Credo. So we've partnered with 
Crossway, the evangelical publishers, and uh, we're doing two main academic projects with that. We have our inaugural lecture coming up pretty soon in November. Uh, that's going to take place November 13th in San Antonio. And we're going to hear from uh, the esteemed Dr. Carl Truman. Mm-hmm. And he's going to be speaking on classical theology and the modern mind. So I'm very excited to, to hear that. And then afterwards, I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I get to participate in a panel discussion. Uh, I use the word participate loosely because when you hear the guest, I am clearly the other guy. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'm fine with that. But uh, yeah, there'll be a panel of, of Dr. Barrett, Dr. Truman, uh, Dr. James Dolezal, and then Dr. Kevin mm. DeYoung. And then uh, me, <laughs> and I'll just be uh, ask some questions. Hopefully they won't ask me any questions. I'll leave uh, <laughs> the answering to them. And then uh, we're also pursuing some some publications. Uh, those those lectures will produce uh, as the new studies in classical theology series. Um, we're doing Thomas Aquinas for Protestants through Crossway, mm. where you know we'll focus on aspects of Thomistic theology and and talk about how they can be applied for Protestants. Um, and I can't say say much on this, uh, but for fans of biblical theology, uh, Credo has a project upcoming that you will like. Uh, but we have to keep keep that close to our chest at the moment. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, your listeners can subscribe to our newsletter on the website and kind of keep track of things like that. But we have a, a lot of fun stuff coming up. And what's the website? Is it CredoMag.com? CredoMag.com. Yep. CredoMag.com. All right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Go there and subscribe. Okay. Now, in terms of classical theology, what kind of got um, you specifically interested in in this idea of recovery um, and putting classical theology in the forefront of people's minds? Yeah. So my personal experience with classical theology, um, it really wasn't until later on in my studies that I experienced this firsthand. Uh, and it wasn't until I began diving into primary sources mm. and I, I felt this interesting combination of familiarity and unfamiliarity, right? Mm-hmm. So like I would read Athanasius and I would think, oh, I, I get a lot of this. This, this sounds like it's coming from a similar world. Mm-hmm. And then every once in a while I would stumble upon something and think, I, I don't have a framework for that just yet. Uh, especially, you know, when you get into like medieval authors, you know, you're reading Augustine, you're reading Thomas Aquinas, you're reading about the Trinity, the doctrine of God, things like that. Uh, and th- some of these doctrines, even though they're very old, may be brand new for uh, a lot of people. That's exactly what it was for myself. And so then it became kind of fleshing out, right? Like I want to understand these sources, which means that I need to understand these concepts and what the church has believed about these concepts, right? Uh, am I the weird one for not recognizing these concepts or are they the weird one for putting them forward? Right. Mm, uh, yeah. Kind of asking that question and, and kind of working through the weeds. So that's kind of what we, we hope to do at, at Credo is to kind of uh, provide some introductory materials to help people think through those issues. Yeah. And it's amazing how unfamiliar people are. And I think that's just a testament to where the church is today with some of our, with the way theology is taught and, and what's emphasized. Um, so kind of along those lines, why would we find classical theology so important to recover for the modern Christian? Uh, and why do you think the church has left a lot of uh, those classical doctrines? Like when we're talking about sola scriptura, there seems to be a lot of confusion around what that really means, et cetera. Sure. Um, yeah. So so thinking of this question, uh, it, it, it made me think of C.S. Lewis and our friend. um Jason Baxter, I got this book here, uh, The Medieval Mind of C.S. Lewis. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, it's a relatively recent book. He's really done us a great service. It's it's a great book, very easy to read. Um, but he, in that book, talks about C.S. Lewis's love for Boethius. Mm. Uh, and particularly the book, uh, The Consolation of Philosophy, which uh, I also have right here. <laughs> uh and how Lewis used the consolation of philosophy as kind of a litmus test to judge the worldview of its readers, right? So like, do you love the consolation of philosophy or do you hate it? That kind of let him know where people stood. Um, But I have a quote from this book that I think is very apt to what we're talking about. 
Uh, so this is what Baxter writes, and then he also quotes Lewis. He said, Lewis's own age was one of proletarianism, which was now in a way similar to Boethius's barbarians, cut off from the classical past and proud of its distance from classical antiquity. We are, and now he's quoting Lewis, self-satisfied to a degree perhaps beyond the self-satisfaction of any recorded aristocracy. Having abandoned the study of the old, modern barbarians no longer have access to any values other than those of modern industrial civilization. Hmm. And so Lewis wondered if, quote, we shall not have to reconvert men to real paganism as a preliminary to converting them to Christianity. Hmm. So I think that's a very helpful quote, uh, both from Baxter and, and from Lewis, and kind of gets at the heart of what theological retrieval is about. We, and I mean all of us, myself included, Dr. Barrett, all of the Credo staff, we have a tendency to be very isolated individuals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and when we cease to study the works from different periods, we start to think that the worldview that we currently possess is the only one there ever was. So modern assumptions that we take for granted and that a pre-modern audience would find very strange uh, become fact to us, right? Un unworthy of examination. This is just how it is. So it's true in philosophy, it's true in political theory, and it's, it's, it's true in theology. So the goals of theological retrieval is to study the Bible with the church, right? We want to ask whether or not there is such a thing as a Christian tradition, mm -hmm. as a pattern of belief. And then once we find the answer to that, we want to ask, is that worth retrieving? Are we still in need of this? Um, and if we find that there is a Christian tradition and we find ourselves disagreeing with that continuity of thought, well, then we need to ask why, mm. right? Uh, we can't just leave that disagreement right. left uh, yep. unexamined. Uh, and so you, you, you follow that up and you, you, know, you ask, uh, why has the church left much of it? Um, that's a, a bit more difficult to answer. Uh, you know, first, th there are churches throughout the world who have maintained confessional and creedal consistency. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't want to overlook those those yeah. very faithful churches mm -hmm. uh, to act like this is just, you know, <laughs> your church listeners has a problem. That's not right. what <laughs> what we're saying. Um, we, you know, overstating the problem as if the contemporary church is just only in a state of anathema. Uh, but, I, you know, I understand what you're getting at and that many of us anecdotally right we we have this journey that led us to classical theology right uh rather than starting from classical theology it, it was something that we had to find right um and you know we can we can talk about this at, at length uh, i know that some of the other questions you wanted to get to kind of uh get at this this issue as well but you know the 20th century saw a rise of you know alternative models to, to theism and to, to Christian mm -hmm. theology, right? I'm thinking of schools of thought such as like, you know, open theism and, and mm -hmm. process theology and, and things like that. Um, but the departure from tradition, you know, the tendency of what Lewis calls chronological snobbery, right? That's, that's not limited to churches. It's really just kind of part of the modern package. Like, a communal mindset has shifted to an individual mindset. A belief in a common human nature has shifted to the rejection of true ontological or uh, metaphysical commonality. And everything becomes increasingly disjointed from one another, right? And then on top of that, you have successes of the modern world. Well, we can look at things like penicillin, right? And we can look at modern inventions and we can convince ourselves that we're better off. Mm. Right. Like why, why would the King of England listen to a caveman? Right. Like uh, we can, we can get that mindset as if we don't need the past because of what we've been able to accomplish. Right. As if we were able to accomplish that apart from our past. Um, 
Yeah, and so I, I don't I don't want to uh, take up too much of the time, but the last thing I'll say about this is is that you know we're always combating memory loss. Yeah. Um, you know, mm-hmm. we have this tendency to desire something new, something we've never seen before. And uh, like we will even downplay the past to, to make the present seem more valuable. Right. And so uh, like if you're a sports fan, uh, I see this in sports all the time. Uh, right. Like we don't want to see just a generational talent. Right. Like we want to see the best player to ever play the game. Mm-hmm. And if there's somebody close to that status, then we will rewrite history in our minds. Hmm. Like we will underplay the successes of a previous generation because like well, we want to see the best. Right. And then you kind of get into the stats of these old players and you're almost surprised to see, oh, wow, they're actually much better than I remember. Hmm. Uh, and it's not until you get into the data. Right. And, and you know, they could even be people that like you cared a lot about, but we have short term memories. Um and so, like this, this happens in everything. This happens in theology. Uh, and so, we have this short memory; it's not in front of us. We think we know what history says. And again, I'm speaking of myself as as much as anybody. And we want to see these new things. We have a desire for novelty, for originality. Um, and you know, like e- even one of uh, no, I'm not speaking with anybody in mind, but like we all have this this tendency to to want to be the guy who says something new that is effective and helpful, mm. uh, and sometimes that can take the place of of explaining what the church has held for you know uh, ages. So that's that's a few like one thousand foot view things that came to mind. Um, but yeah, maybe that's helpful. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting that you're right. We tend to do that at a broad level. And I think maybe even the theological space, maybe we forget that that's just a human tendency in general. And sure. I mean, I don't know if you guys see this out in Missouri, but out here in Virginia with the, the strong Civil War history that we have, there have been those who have, they want to change street names from Confederate generals to, or whatever the case might be for, you know, to different names that are not as offensive or taking down Confederate landmarks or whatever the case might be to kind of stamp out the past as if the, you know, the past doesn't really have any significance, whether those guys were in the right or the wrong. Uh, it, it's like the conversation just wants to stop. We need to focus. We're in our progressive state. We don't need to worry about the past. And if it's offensive, we need to stamp it out from our memories completely. Sure. Um, so yeah, that's just a human tendency. Yeah. I think about, uh, uh, I think about conversations that I've had, uh, with my mom uh, on this. And first of all, before I go any further, let me say that this is not negative. <laughs> like <laughs> my, my mom is the closest thing to a Southern Baptist saint that <laughs> has, has ever lived. Uh, so I'm not, so St. Linda, if you're listening to this, this is, <laughs> this is fine. Uh, but my mom is real sharp and she can, she can go toe to toe when it comes to theological conversations. And so, you know, I'll, I'll bring it, you know, like the Baptist tradition or like uh, historical Baptist beliefs. And at first, you know, when we started having this conversation uh, and you went to her and you said historical Baptist belief, her mind immediately, we think 1950s SBC church. Mm. Like that's that's where it goes to because in, in, you know, in her mind, that was a long time. Right. I mean, that's mm-hmm. you know, getting close to 100 years worth of uh, potential continuity. Now. We all tend to tend to do that, right? Like when we think of our histories, when we think of theological history, we think of you know maybe the past 100 years, mm-hmm. and so we have to kind of push against that to where we start going, okay, how far back are we thinking here, right? We we go in the Reformation, we go in pre-Reformation, we go in patristic, mm. and a- as we kind of push ourselves to consider that, right, it, it opens the door to uh, to benefiting from like the storehouse, right, the uh, the treasuries that we have available to us. Uh, but it is something that we have to to work on ourselves because our default position is to think history, like a few years before I was born, mm. <laughs> and not <laughs> you know a couple of a hundred years <laughs> before our grandparents were born, yeah. right? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's... We're just, we tend to, we're, we're people of our time, you know, and we like to be right. stuck where we are and that we, 
we filter things through our own experience. If it's outside of that, we have a hard time relating to it. Um, yeah. Now, in terms of particular groups that you know need recovery or or might be have a tendency to recovery more, do you think that Baptists seem to have the need for recovery more than other Orthodox groups, or do you see this problem throughout the church in general, in some way, shape, or form? Sure. So uh, there's a couple of caveats I think that need to be made. Uh, so, so first, let me say that the need for theological retrieval is not limited to Baptist right. uh, or, or any group, right? As if this practice could only benefit us because of some unique system of yep. belief, right? That's, that's not what we're saying. So like theological retrieval, when done properly, and you avoid certain pitfalls, that, it, that benefits everyone. Yep. So the common storehouse is available to, to all Christians, and we should all, you know, Baptist, Anglican, Protestants, whoever it may be, take advantage of this. Um, the second thing that we need to kind of, kind of caveat is, is what we mean when we say Baptist, right? Uh, so that's such a big umbrella term, uh, you know, so, uh, your, your church is a, a member of ARPCA, is that right? Uh, no, we're not part of any organization right now, but okay. we are RB church. Okay. Yep. Uh, and so like, you know, Reformed Baptist churches, ARPCA, uh, Southern Baptist churches, that's, they're going to have shared distinctives, obviously, but they're going to have a different culture, a different yep. mindset about a lot of things. And, you know, that doesn't even bring into the conversation something like American Baptists or, you know, non-denominational churches that refer to themselves as Baptistic, right? So we kind of have to be careful with that term uh, because at a certain point, it, it becomes almost impossible to describe everybody in much yep. depth, right? So I'm a member of a Southern Baptist church. Uh, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church. I teach at a Southern Baptist institution. Uh, and so that's the the branch that I can speak to, you know, with the most experience. Yep. Um, so when it comes to, to Southern Baptists uh, and, and many Baptists in general, as I'm sure you know, like we, we have a strong belief in the, the autonomy of the local church. Mm -hmm. So this this commitment to to local church autonomy makes it a little tricky uh to to write what you would call like a proper confession right there's debate about you know whether we should speak about the bf and m 2000 as a confession mm -hmm. whether we should should use it uh with some type of confessional you know authority right that's been in the news a lot um and it gets even trickier uh like when you realize that the sbc technically only exists for two days a year uh, when, yeah, so like the the SBC is limited to when autonomous churches sends their messages to the convention to meet together in an association and to vote on business, uh, which is, you know, uh, a different world. <laughs> and so there's, there's not uh, a lot of like external oversight in what goes on in a local SBC church, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is the responsibility of, of the elders. Uh, and of the congregants, right? So SBC churches will look very different from each other. My home church looks very different from the church that I attend now. Uh, a little different emphases, a, little, a very different vibe, right? Uh, if we can use such language. Uh, and so uh, SBC church may undergo a lot of church, uh, a lot of change in and of itself. So this really enhances the need for each individual congregation to pursue theological continuity, mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, an Anglican, for instance, uh, may become very used to like the readings of creeds, right? Because it's mm -hmm. it's a part of the common book of prayer and it's, it's grafted into every Anglican church that they may attend in their lives, uh, at least in my understanding. But each Baptist church Southern Baptist is going to have to decide for themselves how they are going to incorporate classical theology into their liturgy, right? So ultimately, that autonomous congregationalism is a hallmark of the Baptist interpretation of Scripture, and you know we we can't punt it, right? Like it's not a pragmatic decision, right? And yeah. so elders are are tasked with making sure that their teaching is is biblical. And therefore, like in agreement with the ecumenical creeds, other elders and congregants are, are tasked with knowing theology in order to kind of like take account of a pastor's teaching. Right. They need to be aware of something is out of step. They don't have to be masters in theology or anything like that, but they they need to know enough to recognize when something's weird. <laughs> right. Um, 
even if they can't fully articulate it, right? Something needs to, to be uneasy with them. And so you can see how things like that can, can get a little funky. Um, and without people meeting these responsibilities that we can become lone wolf biblical interpreters and, and, mm -hmm. and lone wolf churches that really don't care for in continuity with church history. Um, and so, yeah, in, in that sense, I would say that it's especially important for Southern Baptists to care about theological retrieval at like an individual level. Because mm. it, it's in an all hands on deck situation that we're making sure that, you know, our local church is uh, promoting biblical fidelity. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we, we don't want to end up being. uh you know, at the individual level, like a congregation of one, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. We, we want to join in with what the church has done. Uh, and, and we don't want to be, we don't want to make autonomy into a license for novelty. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I think that's an unfortunate side effect of, of independency is you tend to have these multiple interpretations of what a particular doctrine might mean without necessarily having that oversight. And I guess you can, you can see why there, there may, there was pushback against the independency of Baptists, particular Baptists, the 17th century from their Puritan counterparts who were, uh, you know, seeing more of a state church setting and wanting to sure. have more oversight. And why would these people have the ability to interpret scripture this way? Look what could happen. And even the Catholic church yeah. with the reformers, Hey, if anyone can interpret scripture the way they want, then all these things might happen. Uh, even though you know we see it as a biblical model, but yeah, I uh, was kind of a side effect of that, unfortunately. I was uh, talking, so I'm currently teaching a Christian political thought class through Spurgeon mm -hmm. College, uh, and I was talking to my class about Roger Williams, who uh, is kind of seen as like the father of like Baptist religious liberty. Um, and he, you know, he really promoted this, this idea of religious liberty and, and freedom for all people, like even if he disagreed with them theologically, which is like a, a Baptist distinctive, especially a Southern Baptist distinctive. And one thing that I, I thought was worth warning my students about um, is that as he was like politically open to religious liberty, he grew more and more independent when it comes to theology, where uh, toward the end of his life, it's my understanding that he, he would only take communion with his wife. Mm. Uh, well, we we need to be aware of that, and we need to combat it. And theological retrieval helps us to do that. Yep. Yep. It helps us to balance those things out, because on the one hand, we don't want to be so independent where we're isolated from the rest of the Christian tradition, but at the same time, um, you know, we don't want to create some kind of overlord. You know, we're not Presbyterians. We don't have some kind of oversight committee that monitors necessarily what we're doing. There, there's a balance that has to be there, biblically speaking. So, yeah, all of that can play into how we're retrieving theology, for good or for Absolutely. bad, I guess, but it all comes into play. Um, you know, now kind of diving into some of the theological issues that come up when talking about retrieving classical theology. Um, you know, in recent years, the doctrine of God be, has kind of come front and center in reform circles. Why do you think um, that this has come under attack? In reform circles, we see people pushing back as it's starting to come up and be retrieved. We see people in our own circles that push back hard against it. Um, why do you think that might be, or some of the issues that might float around with that? Yeah. So, um, you know, once again, this a, a lot could be said here, uh, and so we want to we want to balance being as thorough as we can yep. uh, with my tendency of being uh, overly talkative. <laughs> right. uh, but. Yeah, there's there's a few things that that we could discuss. So, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that the 20th century saw a rise to what I'm going to call like alternative models of God. So, like open theism and, and process theology, to, to name a few. So, like these these two movements, uh, even though they're not the only one, uh, they, they raise a lot of questions concerning the the classical understanding of the divine attributes. All right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one one such process theologian, I got his book right here, uh, Charles Hartshorn. And if you can see, the title of the book is Omnipotence and Other Theological Mistakes. Ouch. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it that, that gives you a pretty good glimpse of what this book is like. Uh, <laughs> Hartshorn wrote this book in five weeks. And oh, uh, okay. it, 
yeah, it uh, it reads like that. Not not that it's like weak or anything like that, um, but I I would classify it, uh, and you know maybe some would disagree as a as a pretty angry book. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like when you're in a in an argument and you don't take a moment to cool down before like responding. Yep. That's a that's kind of how I feel about this book. Uh, in fact, in one of the margins, I wrote, "This guy doesn't like me," because uh, <laughs> that's kind of how I was how I was feeling. Um, but in, in, in this book, he highlights six theological mistakes. Okay. And here are the mistakes that he attributes to what he calls classical theism. Okay. Uh, mistake number one, <laughs> God is absolutely perfect and therefore unchangeable. Uh, he lists omnipotence as a mistake, omniscience as a mistake, God's unsympathetic goodness as a mistake. Uh, and so think in terms of like impassibility there. Mm -hmm. uh, immortality as a career after death <laughs> is oh, one of man. the mistakes. And then uh, an infallible revelation. Uh, so he, he would say all of these are are theological mistakes. And so like he has subheadings throughout the book, such as like what went wrong with classical theism and um, ch chance freedom and the tyrant idea of God, like things like that. So, uh, you know, pretty aggressive. And then we also have uh, guys like this this fella here, uh, Clark Pinnock, most moved mover. Uh, Clark Pinnock, uh, I, I don't know if it's right to say that he's like the father of open theism, but he's one of the most famous ones. And he's pertinent to us because he, he taught at a Southern Baptist seminary uh, before mm -hmm. shifting to, to open theism. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's something that, that we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so in, in both of these models, we see this picture of God as, as becoming Right. As changing, mm -hmm. as as uh, growing in perfections, if you will. Um, so, like, for instance, the open and open theism refers to like the future. Right. So like some open theists will say that that some things in the future are, are absolutely fixed, but that other things are left open. Right. Mm -hmm. And God is uh, what they call omnicompetent. So he's capable of handling what comes up, but anything could come up. It, it, it's, it's truly open. And so. You know, we see this picture of God growing in his understanding of the future, right? He, he's becoming perfect in knowledge. Um, so I bring those up because, like, if those mov movements were isolated communities, uh, then, you know, it'd be kind of hard to determine th their influence. But what we have happen in the 20th century is evangelical scholars uh, become uh, they, they begin to accept the validity of some of these movements critiques mm. so that they don't become open theists. They don't become process theologians, but they hear the questions that these guys are asking and they go, Oh, that's a really good question. And so what, what happens is they began to, to modify our language about the doctrine of God to accommodate these new critiques. Um, and so what you have is what could be called like a neoclassical articulation of classical doctrines. They may use the same terms, but there's new meaning that's being in inserted into these terms. Right. So like now immutability may only refer to God's character, right? His goodness. He's unwavering in his character, but it's not the type of immutability that you will encounter if you read, say, like a Thomas Aquinas or like a Francis Turretin or, or something like that. Uh, and then other or the doctrines were just presented as untenable uh, without really ever being defended. And so, you know, we just took the L on that one. Right. Like we would um, these evidential scholars would just hear these critiques and go, well, yeah, maybe simplicity just doesn't work. And then they'll just kind of move on. Um, you also have like big tent organizations. So like su such as like ETS, for example. Um, mm -hmm. So like the the doctrinal statement for ets which is the evangelical theological society is quite broad like it's only two lines like you believe in the trinity and in inerrancy and but like, that's that's it um and so at ets like you had guys like clark pinnock who were presenting on open theism and open theism was rebuked by ets but open theists were not removed from membership mm -hmm. because like they could sign the doctrinal statement and you know you have academic freedom um, and so that kind of muddied the waters a, l a little bit. Um, and this is, this is really just like a phenomenon of the 20th century. Um, so some of your listeners may be uh, familiar with, with Owen Strand. So yep. I actually, uh, started my, uh, doctoral dissertation under the supervision of Dr. Strand. Mm. And 
uh, it was going to be on the neo-evangelical movement. So like, you know, Carl F.H. Henry and, and uh, Harold John Ockingay and, and guys like that. And what you notice when you start studying the neo-evangelicals is that a lot of their organizations that they started, a lot of the parachurch ministries that they started, be it schools or, or academic organizations, they tend to, to become theologically moderate or, or liberal, mm -hmm. despite them being conservative. And so I asked Dr. Strand his thoughts on that one day, and I, th I thought his answer was really good, that as they created these new organizations, they really weren't tied into any kind of ecclesiological body. Mm. And so there was no church oversight. There was no true confessional doctrinal statement that really got in the weeds right. Uh, and so what happened as we kind of separated ourselves in evangelicalism from this confessionalism, we really didn't have any way to like rebuke people when they got creative. You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah. you're in the, the bounds of our very broad statement. Mm -hmm. uh, you, we're not tied to any church. It doesn't really matter what church you go to. Uh, and so, yeah, we, we get this, this novelty. So we see at the same time in the 20th century, then an increase of novel models of theism and a decrease with, um, confessional authority in these parachurch ministries. Uh, now, you know, a, a confession is not going to articulate every doctrine, right? Um, but without a guardrail, the, the novelty goes unaddressed. Mm -hmm. um, and so, it, you know, it's kind of just the, the perfect storm for this. So you, you have these guys who are asking legitimate questions that would need to be answered. We have our evangelical scholars who are accommodating this and kind of making new systems to, to make everybody happy, sometimes even like admittedly so, like that's what they're saying they're doing. And then you also have this this lack of confessionalism as evangelicalism is growing in its popularity and influence. Mm -hmm. Perfect storm. And, you know, it's not unusual for theological retrieval or really anything like it to grow out of a recognition of problems. Mm. Right. Like it sometimes we need somebody to say something outrageous before we're like, oh, man, I need help thinking this through. Mm. And so it really set the stage for what we're now seeing as this rise of theological retrieval, because people are understanding, like, we need help to address this. Um, and so hopefully that trend will continue. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm confident that it will. Yeah, it's that's very interesting. And it's funny, you know, talking about historical theology, you see that pattern happen with uh, like the Sicinian crowd and and people who float in that as soon as they left that confessional, um, that traditional biblical tradition that were the guide rails for how people were to think biblically, they started to deteriorate in their theology very, very quickly. And so, you know, we have historical precedent for, uh, you know, for reacting against that. I think the way that we do this has happened before, guys, and it's it's <laughs> not. So <laughs> See, see that road over there? We've done this before. We don't want to do that again. Um, but yeah. All right. Um, kind of moving along here, talking, you know, we the doctrine of God has kind of come up. And then also the understanding of how philosophy integrates with, you know, biblical thinking. Now, that's another thing that seems to be pushed back against as we're retrieving classical theology. So how, sure. What are some practical ways that we can integrate a biblical philosophy uh, into our theological conversations? Right. So this ties into a lot of different things. Um, you know, we could discuss something like natural theology, natural mm -hmm. law and its place in the Reformed tradition. Uh, we could discuss, you know, metaphysics and how like some pretty complicated concepts like act and potency have, have mm -hmm. you know, played a role in theology proper for Protestants. Um, but we can, all, you know, without getting too far into specifics, we can also just make some general statements about philosophy. Um, at, at the very least, all of your listeners are being influenced by philosophers, mm -hmm. right? That that's a universal issue. Now they may not be being influenced by good philosophers, right? Mm -hmm. But they there are people who have our ears who are teaching us these things, right? 
like ethical arguments or moral arguments are philosophical arguments, right? Because ethics is a branch of philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, arguments concerning human natures or like the definition of a human person, right? Those are philosophical arguments that are very pertinent today. Um, arguments concerning like how we can know God, right? Like our knowledge of God. These are epistemological arguments. So like the branch of philosophy that studies knowledge. Um, I got another quote for you. This one's by Chesterton. Uh, and my my second reader, uh, the second uh, man on my dissertation committee uh, was actually Thor Madsen, who teaches at Midwestern. And he is, uh, without a doubt, one of the, the sharpest thinkers I've met. That guy, he is a one percenter, let me tell you. Hmm. Um, but he, he shared this uh, quote from Chesterton with me. Uh, it's a little lengthy, but, you know, it, I, I think it, I think it's worth it. So Chesterton writes, uh, philosophy is merely thought that has been thought out. Hmm. It is often a great bore. <laughs> That's hmm. a good follow up. Uh, but man has no alternative except between being influenced by thought that has been thought out and being influenced by thought that has not been thought out. Hmm. The latter, the latter thought that has not been thought out is what we commonly call culture and enlightenment today. But man is always influenced by thought of some kind, his own or somebody else's, that of somebody he trusts or that of somebody he never heard of, thought at first, second, or third hand, thought from exploded legends or unverified rumors, and this is the real crux of it, but always something with the shadow of a system of values and a reason for preference. A man does test everything by something, the question here is whether he has ever tested the test. Mm. So uh, I share that with my philosophy students. It's very helpful. Um, so it, it's not unusual for theologians to uh, define theology in like a Websterian sense, like uh, following John Webster, who defined theology as the study of God and all things in relation to God. Mm. And that's where really uh, lies the rub that in uh, all things in relation to God. It's like when we make certain claims about God, Christ, the church, we are necessarily implying certain truths about reality. Hmm. Uh, Kevin Van Hooser calls ministers of the gospel ministers of reality, hmm. right? Like we, we are testifying to the true order of nature. So understanding that claim we have to ask ourselves what must be true in order for these biblical claims to be true mm. right it's, it's it's a coherent system god is free from contradiction and so this is where like a strong theo philosophical interest can can really come in handy right like every everyone has a system of thought everyone has values there's always a reason for preference and if we're not careful then when we accept those philosophies, we inadvertently accept the values that come with them. Okay. We might not do that perfectly. We may be inconsistent. And in this sense, maybe that's even a blessing to us. But they will affect the way that we see God and all things in relation to God. Right. So we have to ask ourselves the question like, which philosophical school of thought is most consistent with scripture and long held Christian? belief. And unless you're specifically looking to the answer to that question, it's very unlikely that you're just going to luck into the right answer, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like that you just like draw one out of a hat and it's like, oh yeah, I got it now. Uh, <laughs> it, we have to be aware of that investigation. Mm -hmm. Now the, the counter, the other side of things, we don't want to give philosophy the pride of place where we reason away very clear apparent biblical claims right now even though if we were to do that we would be reasoning poorly right because of the mm -hmm. coherent nature nature of reality um but we don't want to give ourselves that out right we need to recognize that the role that philosophy has played in history and that is the handmaiden of theology mm -hmm. right so when it comes to like the how uh you know we start with our bibles Right. We are we are people of the book. We also need to read, you know, philosophically rich sources. Right. Whether, whether we like it or not, you know, Aristotle and Plato and these men, that they've made quite the impact on some of your favorite thinkers. Right. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you love Augustine, 
well, you need to be at least familiar with what Plato was, was saying, yep. right? Uh, there's a lot in there. Um, and, you know, a bit a bit of that is is learning the language, which is honestly the hardest part. Um, and so this is where you can get like good uh, philosophical or theological dictionaries. So I have a couple here that I can show you that may be helpful. Um, so we have like Vulner, the Dictionary of Scholastic Philosophy. Uh, this book is not very big. Uh, the definitions are short. They are helpful. And so, like, if you want to know, like, what medieval or early modern theologians, like, how they were using these terms, this is a good starting point. Um, if you want to go, like, man, if you want to be hardcore, like, if you just want to be the guy who gets this stuff, uh, you can do uh, Richard Mueller. Yep. Mueller, not sure. Dictionary of Latin and Greek Theological Terms. This is a more theological dictionary, but it's very philosophical in nature. Mm-hmm. It gives you the, the full concept. Um, it And it, it really shows you how the uh, specifically, like, the post-Reformation, like Reform Scholastics, were, were using these terms. So these are like Protestant forefathers using these philosophical concepts uh, to articulate theological beliefs. Um, and hey, that is that is a an exceptionally helpful source. Mm. Yeah, it's... And I think being in the day and age we are now, we have the benefit of being able to have this plethora of material to go back on. And having it so readily available in a way that we didn't before. Right. Um, being able to just go online and look at these databases of old English books or whatever the case might mm-hmm. be, where we can just pull up these materials very easily, um, yeah. I think really helps us. And that, to to your point right there, we we have short-term memory loss, again, because like we we forget that this is a, a, a recent thing, right? Yeah. Uh, so, like the books that I'm surrounded by right now, like when I, the Sharnock, the the Turretin, the Maastricht, like the physical copies that I have, they've all been published in my lifetime. Mm. And so, like if you were doing theology in like the 1970s, it was just a totally different game, right? You better have uh, known Latin, right? <laughs> yes, yeah. And so, like, yeah, the accessibility, like, uh, we shouldn't take that for granted. Uh, and yeah, these books are. They're hard, you know. Some of them requires a good bit of work, but like, what a what a blessing to to have the work available. <laughs> yeah, amen, amen. And kind of along those lines, uh, Doctor Crowder, or I'm sorry, Pastor Crowder, put a question here. I wonder how Doctor Gate would recommend a pastor or layman begin the journey of theological retrieval in their own ministry context. Sure. Um, so that's an excellent question. Um, I like having books to like show. Uh, yeah. The book that I want to show, I don't have. Right, Sounds like me. you have a pretty cool library. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, this is what dissertation does to you. It, it surrounds you by books and makes you feel a little crazy. But yeah. uh, recently, uh, there's been a published a collection of both creeds and confessions. Um, I can't, like a, a reader's guide to creeds and confessions, something like that. Hmm. Um, uh, it has the red cover. See, this is, imagine the book right here. Uh, but I think that's the best place to start is um, reading the ecumenical creeds. So when I say that, I mean Nicaea, um, I mean the Chalcedonian definition, I mean the Athanasius Creed, right? Uh, The Apostles' Creed, those creeds that have been universally accepted by the church as promoting true biblical doctrine. Uh, And that's a great place to start because you would be surprised how many like students I have who have been raised in the church, who are faithful, Holy Spirit-filled believers with faithful, Holy Spirit-filled parents. And then I show them, like, the definition of Chalcedon, which is the articulation of, of, of the doctrine of Christ and the two natures of Christ. And they're like, whoa, I would have said this wrong. Like, I mm. I didn't know this. Like, this is new information. And so starting there is accessible, it's easy, and that's really the stuff that you want to be in continuity with, right? Like, if you punt Nicaea, but you happen to be in line with some third-tier issues of one of the Reformed confessions, that you still have a problem on your hands. Um, so yeah, start with the ecumenical creeds, and then I would move to Reformed confessions. And so if you're the Baptist, like uh, the London Baptist Confession of Faith, things like that, um, obviously if you're Presbyterian, the Westminster Confession, um, the 39 articles, things like that. And the more you read of those things, the more agreement you will find, right? Uh, we we tend to think of confessions as this articulation of what makes us different. 
Mm. Right. So like if, if you want to read what Baptist thinks, you read the London Baptist confession, but the authors of the confession went to a, a great deal of trouble to show continuity with like yep. the Westminster. Right. Yep. And I, I love the phrase that they use to describe it. Uh, it's the title of my column in Credo wholesome Protestant doctrine. Mm. Uh, that makes me so happy every time I hear it. And so you want to you want to read these confessions so that you can recognize the continuity of the wholesome Protestant doctrine. And then, you know, once you work through there, then we can start talking about like some secondary sources, some more contemporary. There's a, a, a great wealth available um, that have been written in the last 10 years about this stuff. But that's where I would begin. Great, great. And I guess kind of as we close out here, um, are there any other theological issues that you see coming up in reform circles as you're doing your work with Credo Mag and Center of Classical Theology? Anything relevant that you're seeing on the horizon or that keeps popping up? I think there's a, a couple of things uh, that, you know, are hot button issues right now. Um, and I have been not su surprised, uh, but interested in my students' responses to such things. Uh, you know, I, I got old real fast. I don't know how it happened, uh, but they keep me in touch with what's happening on social media and things like that. Um, and so when I, when I think about like theological retrieval and, and what people are talking about and what may come in the distance, uh, I think about like a, an increased interest in like covenantal thinking, like covenantal theology. Uh, um, I've seen people talk about, you know, dispensationalism and covenant theology. I've seen the term like reformed dispensationalism make uh head waves you know and then debates about whether or not that's an apt title for you know that that system of belief um and so i think that's going to be a thing right uh this this issue between covenantal theology as baptist you know uh 16 9 federalism and reform dispensationalism within baptist circles feel political retrieval right i mean you yeah. can't you can't open an app and scroll for one minute without being hit with christian nationalism and <laughs> And, and topics like that, right? Yeah. Um, and so like my, my students in my uh, political theology class, they, they have this like desire to retrieve classical sources on political theory. Like they don't, mm. they don't just have an interest in reading what Ronald Reagan may have said about conservatism. Like, <laughs> like they want like, what did 17th century Baptists think about religious liberty, right? Like they're, mm. they have that hunger and so I think that's going to increase and going to open its own doors for conversation. Um, classical apologetics. Hmm. So, you know, using something like, say, Thomas's five ways for the existence of God compared to like a, a Vantillian presuppositionalism, for instance, that that always garners a lot of interest. People have a lot of questions about that. Hmm. Are they mutually exclusive? Can they somehow be compatible? Right. Um, yeah, so those are those are some things that I see creep up a lot in just like day to day conversations. Mm. OK, OK. Yeah, it, it sounds like you have a lot of work ahead of you. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> yeah, there's a there's a lot of people who are very qualified to handle yeah. a lot of these things. <laughs> well, Dr. Gatewood, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a, a blessing. One of the things I enjoy about having uh, other brothers on the show is you get to connect with other like minded brethren. Uh, even though you're far away, you feel very close in Christ. So it it is it's a blessing to fellowship and to and to talk through issues with other brothers. So thank you for joining me today, Pat or um, Dr. Gatewood. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, you're good. No, uh, yeah, I, I I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. it's it's always a joy to to do things like that and and like you said to to meet new people. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll be able to do it again in the future. Yeah, I hope so, brother. I hope so. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and Lord willing, we will be back soon. Take care.